Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, which is all about how housing providers could and should be getting their own houses in order when it comes to environmental sustainability. I'm Martin Hilditch, I'm the editor of Inside Housing, and this event, sponsored by Enenco, is focused on how landlords can reduce the consumption of energy and other resources within their own organisations. And this is very much focused on um, the, the organisational as opposed to the um, uh, housing stock, um, although no doubt we'll be, we'll be talking a little bit about both. Um, before I introduce our fantastic panel of speakers today, um, I'll just set out a little bit of background to introduce the event um, so we all know where, what we're about and what we're here for. So yeah, today's, today's event comes at a time of significant flux um, and change in the social housing sector. Uh, as they plot their way into the post-pandemic era, many landlords are reviewing the size, the location and the purpose of their office buildings. While some are talking about relocation, others are talking about repurposing of existing buildings and sharing space with other community-based organisations. Um, so that, that's kind of where, where we are. And then, of course, in, into that kind of mix, uh, there's the UK government's target to become net zero carbon by 2050. As organisations look to repurpose their workspace, this brings significant opportunity to improve performance and future-proof businesses. We'll also be looking at the wider carbon, carbon footprint of social landlords and how they can best work to reduce their impact. So quite a lot to get through um, and some, some really important stuff to, to get to grips with today. Yeah, plenty up for grabs and, and also a responsibility, I guess, within the sector not to waste the moment. This session will focus on answering practical questions about what net zero means for our offices, buildings, um, and for, for our businesses, uh, the steps providers could and should be taking now, um, and a look, at, a look at some of the work that's been done to date. So what's out there, what learning is there, what should we be picking up on? Um, all of that we're gonna be moving through and looking at um, uh, this afternoon. As I mentioned a moment ago, we've got an absolutely fabulous panel um, to provide some of those answers and um, some of the thinking uh, today. We'll be hearing from Hannah Dillon, the head of campaign at Zero Carbon, which advocates for fair and effective carbon pricing. And then we'll be hearing from Lubo Jankovic, professor of advanced building design and director of the Zero Carbon Lab at the University of Hertfordshire. And Dan Pardesi, head of social housing with Enco, will be sharing his insight into the key ingredients for success. And last but not least, Will Ray, Head of Sustainability with Clarion Housing Group, will be filling us in on the steps it's been taken so far and top tips for, for everybody to take away back to their own organisations. So that's that's who we'll be hearing from today. And before we, we, we move into those presentations, a couple of things to go through. Um, before we start, a, a really a quick reminder that this is, this is your session. This is about um, things that are useful to you and your own organisations, your takeaways and what, what you can bring back to, to your own places of work. Um, so please use a Q&A box on the screen um, to send in your questions uh, to our panel. And after the presentations, I'll get through as many of those as possible. Um, but yeah, just use that Q&A box and we'll make sure we answer the questions that are most um, useful to you. Um, so yeah, do, do make use of that throughout the presentations and I can pick up when those are finished. One more thing before we, we move into those presentations, we've got a quick poll just to to get a bit of a feel for where the audience is at today is fairly broad stuff. Um, but yeah, the question is, how would you rate your own organization's performance on environmental sustainability? Um, so yeah, four options, very good, good, poor, and very poor. And yeah, like I say, it just, just to get a bit of a feel for the room and, and where we are today, and, and then that'll help guide the questions later as well. And um, so, right, we've given you a few seconds uh, to answer. So let's Flash the answers up on screen. What, 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 are we, what are we learning about our audience today? Where, where are you at? Well, this, this, this is uh, good news in part, I think. So 63% uh, of the audience today um, think they're good. Um, very, very, very small percentage, very good. Um, but but uh, interestingly, about a third, uh, uh, so, well, yeah, a third um, either poor, um, uh, which is 30%, or very poor. So, so in, in, in interesting contrast there, and, and uh, yeah, uh, some, some, some interesting uh, guide for, for our conversation to follow. Speaking of which, it is time to move to those presentations, and uh, we'll be kicking off with um, uh, with Hannah, who is, is now flashing up on the screen. So, Hannah, it is over to you. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Um, I've just noticed that I'm wearing 
the same jumper that I was wearing in the headshot that you presented now, which I think says uh, more about my wardrobe choices than I would like. Um, so I'm Hannah Dillon. I'm head of the Zero Carbon Campaign. And as Martin said, we advocate for stronger, fairer and more consistent carbon pricing to play a key role in facilitating the UK's transition towards net zero. Um, now, I'm conscious that others are likely to talk a bit more to the specifics of the operational changes that you can make to get your houses in order. Um, and just to reiterate, we think that this is incredibly important. But as a relative outsider to the sector, I'm going to use my time to highlight the role that we think advocacy can play in getting your house in order, specifically through how, how advocacy can help businesses contribute to societal and environmental progress beyond your traditional service offerings. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk to today. I hope that I'm not taking liberties there. Um, and first, I'm just going to set out a bit of the challenge ahead, which hopefully will set the context for today's discussion. Um, the, this chart here just shows the challenge that our government have set us, um, which is achieving net zero by 2050. This is a story at the moment of different sectors. Some progress is being made and more progress is made, being made in some sectors than others. You'll see that line at the top is the power sector. A lot of progress over the last few years. The solid orange line in the middle is the residential sector, um, which of course is part of the challenge that we're here to talk about today. The second part of that challenge is achieving net zero at a price that society can afford. Now, this is a challenge that you'll all be very, very familiar with, um, but I do think it's worth reiterating. This chart here shows um, energy spend as a percentage of total household expenditure, just to reiterate the point that it is those on lowest incomes who face the biggest cost when it comes to their energy usage, but also that this is a challenge that will likely be reiterated across um, multiple different areas as we seek to decarbonize. Uh, and of course, there's multiple ways that we can uh, achieve net zero. A huge part of that is what we're here to talk about today, so our own business operations. But one of the things we wanted to bring into that conversation was fit for purpose policy design, um, which is where we believe advocacy can come in. Now, this is a slightly tongue in cheek presentation of recent news shots around the Green Homes Grant. And I, I'm purely using this point to highlight um, that even with the best intentions, without proper private and public sector collaboration, policy design can go slightly awry. Um, and this quote here is from Jan Rosenau and Louise Sunderland of the Regulatory Assistance Project. And they spend a huge amount of time thinking very deeply about how we can collectively ensure that the low carbon transition doesn't adversely impact those who can least afford it. Um, and they've said that the Green Homes Grant would have looked very different if the design had started with a clear knowledge of the needs of the households commissioning the works, of the structure of the supply chain, and of the physical efficiency measures it would deliver. And, and I'm sharing this purely to highlight the current gap that there appears to be, and therefore to open space for us to talk about the role that many of you can play and likely are playing in filling that sort of co-policy design gap. And just to move on to build a bit of a case for action, which hopefully you're all up for because you're all here talking to us today. Um, this is from some polling that we conducted recently just to highlight consumer attitudes towards climate change, but also energy efficiency too, because that feels like a relevant topic to talk about. Um, the public are increasingly concerned about climate change. 83% cite it as being a concern and 54% think that it's one of, if not the most pressing issues at the moment. They recognize heat as playing a part of that. So 27% cite heat as being one of the top three activities contributing to UK carbon emissions. But very few have tried switching from gas to electricity predominantly because of perceived cost, but also they're concerned about disruption in their homes. And I share this just to highlight that how much those who have control over energy inputs, the role that they have to play in driving change. This slide validates the reason that everyone's come here today. This is from the Institute of Business Ethics, and it, uh, every year they conduct a survey. This is from December of last year to find out what people want from businesses in terms of ethical behavior, corporate tax avoidance, always comes in on top, but environmental responsibility has crept up the agenda in recent years um, and is now coming in at second, um, which is good news for all of those who are wanting to do something about it. Um, and there's also an expectation of action. So this comes from the Edelman Trust Barometer. I'm not sure how familiar those listening will be with it, but it's essentially a global survey conducted every year to look into how people perceive businesses and what they want from businesses as well. Um, and these are global figures shared on the slide, but UK percentages do track this level shown here. So there's a big 
expectation for businesses to step in and fill the perceived void that has been left by government, which is exactly why we're talking about advocacy today. A huge percentage of people want CEOs to step in and other leaders when the government doesn't fix societal problems, but also to take the lead on change rather than waiting for change to be imposed on them. Um, this is also from an Edelman survey, and it's a specific survey they conducted last year about what the expectation of business response to the coronavirus crisis. And um, I know that's a different crisis, but I've highlighted how high public concern is about climate change, and this is increasingly being viewed as a crisis. So I think we can probably infer a similar expectation on how businesses address both of these two things. Um, and again, just to show that figure on the left, 90% want uh, businesses to partner with government to address these crises. So again, a reiteration and celebration of the intent that everyone's showing by being here today. Um, and this slide, apologies to anyone listening that doesn't self-define as being a business, but I do think it's really striking and quite shocking that businesses are now seen as the only institution that is both competent and ethical. So no pressure there, um, but it does just highlight the role that businesses have to play in addressing this crisis. And I just thought I'd, I'd focus a bit more on what action really means, because I'm aware advocacy can mean different things to different people. And actually, when it comes to the public, there's a slight misconception that advocacy is actually lobbying. And that just to talk to that picture on the left there, that we are all turkeys trying to promote the concept of a non-traditional Thanksgiving. And I just wanted to reiterate that that is absolutely not what we see advocacy as doing. We see advocacy as being essentially doing your bit, which is exactly why we brought it into this discussion of getting your own house in order. And this, again, apologies, is from Edelman, a very trusty resource. Um, but and, and please forgive the use of the word brand there. This really is just referring to businesses and organizations. But the four top recommendations that the public have for how businesses can help address crises are showing up and doing your bit, which, of course, lots of you have done a lot of already and are doing again today not acting alone, but collaborating, really working with each other to solve these problems, solving rather than selling, which I think is less relevant here, and communication. And I'm just going to ground that quickly um, in, in those, I believe, are listening today, just to make it a bit more specific. So in this context, we see advocacy as acting on behalf of those living in your homes, whether that's representing them, um, collaborating with government and others in the sector to develop fit-for-purpose decarbonisation policies, or through communication, so driving uptake and support for fair decarbonisation policies through effective communications. And I'm conscious that this might not traditionally be seen as part of getting your own houses in order, um, and that I may have taken a few liberties in talking to it, but we do think it's a really important part of that discussion and one that is often underrepresented, which is why I wanted to talk about it today. Um, I think I might have been a bit short on time, but that's it for me for now. So, yeah, looking forward to hearing from other speakers um, and for getting to questions a bit later. Thank you very much, Hannah. Abs absolutely perfect on time. Um, very much appreciated. Really fascinating presentation. Um, and uh, on the clothing uh, aspect, anybody who's been watching any of our webinars will, will know that uh, they've seen this shirt before. So um, <laughs> the, the dawning realisation of our audience about how few shirts I actually own um, uh, will, will be striking people. Thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder to that audience um, that uh, the Q&A box is there. Um, get those questions coming in and I'll pick up on as many as possible um, after the presentation. So thank you all very much and thanks to Hannah. Right, um, Lubo, it is, it is over to you. Welcome and um, please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, speaking speaking of wardrobes, yes, I also realised that my headshot in the slides uh, I was with uh, with the same shirt as as I have today. Uh, I can assure you that I have other shirts as well. So uh, apologies if <laughs> I'm too similar to my headshot. But uh, what I wanted to talk about today is the uh, uh, the meaning and, and challenge of uh, net zero. And um, um, can I have next slide, please? Yes, OK, I'm, I have controls now, sorry. OK, I won before. So the context is that uh, UK is legally bound to reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2050. And that is expected to be achieved by decarbonizing the grid and reducing demand, so a combination of those two things. However, uh, 
I'm conscious that uh, a, a number of buildings are uh, going uh, up, uh, uh, designed and built to partel building regulations, which are not net zero. And uh, these buildings that are built today will last uh, for good uh, 50, if not 100 years. So the house in which I live is 100 years old and is still you know, uh, in good shape. Mm -hmm. So um, how does that, uh, uh, what does that uh, mean in terms of uh, uh, offices and buildings from which social landlords operate? If you look at uh, carbon emissions per square meter floor area, and this is coming from, uh, from a, a project uh, that uh, my team and I have been working on, uh, so uh, different proportions uh, for different uh, types of properties uh, may apply. But um, if we just look at what's happening now, if we build a new building as per part L, then uh, the red line will determine or will represent uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, over a number of years. Now, this includes uh, embodied emissions uh, from materials that have been used to construct a building and also cumulative emissions uh, from energy use. So this is the red line. If we retrofit uh, a building that has just been designed and constructed to Partel, if we retrofit it in 10 years' time, then uh, the uh, orange uh, line uh, is representing that situation. And uh, we see that uh, uh, carbon emissions will start going down, but only after an initial period of going up and coinciding with, with the uh, red line. And as you can see, it will take a long beyond the year 2050, in fact, long beyond 2070, before this hits zero. Now, if we design to part uh, to, to net zero today, uh, to start with, that is represented with uh, a blue line. And uh, we start with some embodied uh, emissions uh, per uh, square meter floor area. So we are above zero. And then, because of uh, diminishing carbon emissions during during the period of operation, we are going towards zero, but we are going to uh, hit zero only around year 2070. So the only way we can actually achieve net zero operation and embodied carbon before 2050, if we go for uh, a new build as per net zero design with hemp lime construction or some other um, photosynthetic material that is involved in, in the building construction. That is represented uh, with the uh, green curve. So we still start with uh, positive embodied emissions, uh, having reduced emissions uh, from the negative embodied carbon in hemp lime, and then uh, gradually we hit a zero just before 2050. So um, this is only part of, uh, of the story. Uh, another part of the equation is that, uh, I seem to be, yes. Another part of the equation is, is the costs. So um, if we look at the same uh, situation as, uh, as uh, in the four cases in the previous slide, then uh, if we uh, design and build to part L now, then the red curve, red line will demonstrate or represent the increasing costs. Um, if we uh, retrofit in 10 years, then the orange line uh, will represent uh, the costs, which will start uh, um, a, a smaller incline, but only after an initial investment in 2031. And then the uh, uh, green line is the uh, uh, new build as per net zero uh, with hemp lime construction that is going to be a bit higher than new build uh, with conventional construction, but still going in the same direction at the same uh, inclination. So what we can see is that uh, 
if we don't do anything now, or if we just build to Partel and then retrofit in 10 years, we're going to spend far more money than if we start uh, doing net zero uh, uh, carbon design uh, uh, now and retrofit now. Um, okay, now, all uh, uh, precedents for this uh, kind of activities are already established. Uh, we have experience of using photosynthetic materials. So if you look at the uh, upper left corner of this slide, uh, there's me ho holding a block of uh, hemp lime uh, with a bit of leaf to show what, what that is. And that looks a little bit like Weetabix. And that, uh, when you use that in construction, you uh, don't need any thermal insulation. This is your thermal insulation, as well as, uh, as uh, your uh, regulator of internal uh, temperature and relative humidity. And you can see be below those two, below uh, that uh, 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 image, uh, there's uh, GlaxoSmithKline uh, building in Ware in Hertfordshire, uh, which is uh, uh, Net zero is carbon negative, and then uh, there's a residential development underneath in Swindon, which I was involved in monitoring. We also uh, have participated in design of uh, uh, retrofit, which was uh, uh, which is the middle set of uh, uh, images, and uh, that was off-site construction, uh, uh, off-site development of, of uh, 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 external insulation panel, and then on-site uh, implementation. And uh, we have uh, Zero Carbon uh, House as a living lab where we are conducting uh, instrument and mon monitoring and we have uh, very good participation, uh, very good collaboration from, from the architect John Christopher, who, who is actually, uh, whose house it actually is. And he is uh, uh, providing us with uh, uh, access to monitor his house. And the book that you see on the right uh, is my book on designing zero carbon buildings and that has been around for uh, several years this is now in the second edition and has been used worldwide so all these tools and precedents are available to us and we can do uh, net zero now so um, what can social landlords do to improve the energy efficiency of their office buildings in the post pandemic era uh, first demand reduction is required a uh, demand reduction in retrofit of existing buildings. We first need to use building performance simulation as part of design process rather than uh, less uh, effective methods such as SAP or uh, PHPP. Uh, we need to improve energy efficiency of the building envelope using photosynthetic insulation materials such as hemp fiber. We need to improve uh, energy efficiency of the fixed building services, such as lighting, heating, and cooling. We need to integrate renewable energy systems, such as solar photovoltaic, solar thermal, biomass heating, uh, ground source or air source heat pumps. And we need to start looking at hydrogen generation and storage, because that can provide us with uh, uh, seasonal storage, which you can generate hydrogen now from or in summer from, uh, from uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, arrays and then store it and use it in winter for, for heating and pump it into the gas system. We need to develop community energy schemes for energy production and consumption sharing simply because uh, uh, exporting energy from a PV has, uh, not, uh, um, has become uh, less uh, economically attractive. And we can improve efficiency of building heat and cooling controls by using predictive control, which are known to save up to 35% of energy. And um, what can social landlords do to improve the energy efficiency of their office buildings in, uh, in post-pandemic era? Uh, when it comes to uh, construction of new buildings, Again, use building performance simulation as part of design process, design high thermal efficiency of the building envelope, use efficient fixed building services, uh, pretty much everything the same as, as with retrofit, except uh, um, retrofit is uh, something of an uh, afterthought, and uh, this is something of a pre-thought. So 
we need to put all those things into design process and uh, uh, use uh, photosynthetic materials as much as possible for construction as they have uh, a negative embodied carbon. So I think this is all what we had time for, for my talk. Uh, my contact details are here and I'll be very happy to uh, answer any questions either now uh, during, during the uh, panel discussion or after the event if uh, anyone wants to contact me. I'd also like to uh, draw your attention to a conference that we're organizing at Hartwish uh, on pathways to uh, zero carbon cities. And uh, if anyone is interested, uh, details are there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lubo. A absolutely a fascinating presentation, lots to pick up on. And there are lots of questions um, coming in now. Um, so just a reminder, if, you, if you're, you're tuning in, this is obviously an opportunity to get the answers that you can take back um, to, to using your day-to-day -day, um, uh, jobs. So please, please do um, get those questions coming in and I'll get through as many as possible after the presentations. Well, speaking of which, let's, let's uh, crack on. Um, thank you very much, Lubo and Dan. Uh, welcome. And it is over to you. Please take it away. Great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, uh, you can see the slides that have just come up. Uh, so, again, thanks for thanks for joining us, and um, really good to hear some of the other speakers talk. I think uh, today I, I really want to focus on how social housing providers can ensure environmental sustainability with their own within their own key organisations. So, as Martin said, talking more about the uh, the organisational. Um, carbon footprint and environmental impacts rather than the housing stock. I'm going to focus on just a handful of key areas in the short time that we've got. So really, uh, you know, what are the key areas to, to focus on and actually why, uh, which some of the other speakers have already sort of touched on already. Uh, but then actually, what can we do to really reliably evaluate the performance in these areas? And then how can we most effectively improve these areas? What are the ingredients for success? In a, um, in a program that actually delivers results. And then think about a couple of, of key takeaways in the short time that we've got. So just to, just to start off uh, and to sort of go through um, some of the, the reasons that we've already talked about, what's the actual reason behind this change? What's, what's the why behind this? I mentioned there's really been a grand swell of societal expectations on environmental sustainability over the last couple of years. And we've really seen a paradigm shift based on um, lots of Attenborough documentaries that we all like to love. We've seen the Extinction Rebellion campaigns. We've seen Build Back Better campaigns as we've uh, as we plan to emerge from the, the COVID lockdown. And some pledges from household names really to address the climate crisis. And I think, as, as Hannah said, that really is reflected in, in, in the statistic that she mentioned, where there was 29% of consumers wanting environmental sustainability to be demonstrated from the businesses and organisations that they engage with. In social housing, this, this really links to some of the, the core, uh, core values of the sector, uh, links entirely to social con the social conscience. So you know, really trying to improve lives of those who need it most. And actually, we see these, these two concepts of sustainability um, and uh, social conscious linking very well to the sustainable development goals put in place by the UN. So delivering sustainable communities, sustainable housing, quality education, uh, well-being and reducing poverty. But actually, it's, it's, it's more than that now. It's actually a business imperative for the UK social housing sector. There's more and more investors that are looking to social housing um, and their strong, responsible investment credentials um, to you know, ultimately deliver um, sustainability and ESG-linked uh, funding, which can help development. I think uh, uh, in a recent uh, uh, document, I saw that major UK pension investors and, are now considering ESG as equally important in their credit process as balance sheet and PL, uh, as P&L. So it's, it's a really important to have a, a credible process in this area and the ability to, you know, to finance new developments and to address the housing crisis 
is ultimately going to um, largely be impacted by your environmental performance. The challenge with this, though, has been, uh, as a sector, how do, we, how do we demonstrate this? In the past, we've seen different organisations choosing different criteria, different good news stories to, uh, to talk about what they're doing. So um, last year in 2020, there was, a, there was a piece of work done by a working group of lots of housing associations and uh, financiers to bring together a sustainability, a standard sustainability reporting model. And the environmental of that, that model focused very much around climate change, ecology and resource use. So really important uh, to you know, address these areas in the, uh, the plan that is, that is being put together. And actually, it links very well to some of the macro trends that we're seeing in society now. Not just the um, displacement of, of fossil fuels as, as fuel, but actually also then how we uh, fill the gap in terms of energy provision, in terms of electricity charging to actually operate these. And also, very importantly, as we've mentioned already, the decarbonisation of heat. So to, to start off, just a couple of thoughts around how we can reliably evaluate uh, performance in, in these areas. So I think it's, it's really important to, to, to mention at the start, it's, it's really important to get the correct metrics. Ultimately, we can't manage what we don't measure. So in order to identify what we are going to measure, we need to think about the key impacts, what um, uh, elements of your environment impact are material, what, and what can be done um, to to collect data to target those areas. So particularly thinking about your, your greenhouse gas emissions and your impact on climate change, largely being driven by you know, utilities and, and fleet um, from your corporate emissions. Actually, what's, what's the comparison against your peers and in industry best practice? So I've mentioned the ESG sustainability standard reporting um, methodology. That's a, a great benchmark which has been uh, agreed um, by the sector and something that could be looked at to, to uh, provide a standardised uh, reporting methodology. And I think it's worth mentioning as well that actually the social housing sector can look to other areas and other sectors and industries and not necessarily um, reinvent the wheel. So there's lots of established methodologies and processes to target these um, environmental impacts. So perhaps the use of things like the um, uh, standard energy and carbon reporting process to report your uh, carbon footprint, looking at a repeatable process to set a, a baseline in terms of carbon emissions or resources and to continue to measure it against it. And the use of credible processes to evaluate performance against um, objectives projects using things like the International Performance and Measurement Verification Protocol. Ultimately, uh, a lot of what I'm saying re relies on having good quality data. So data availability is a real um, challenge uh, in this area and something that is worthwhile setting up a, a good process and a good plan to deliver. So setting up some kind of data framework which focuses on what data you have now, perhaps around your scope one and two emissions, scope one emissions looking at direct emissions from things like your gas consumption, things like refrigerant gas leakage, um, and scope two looking at things like your electricity usage. But then also considering what the strategy should be for your scope three emissions. So upwards in the value chain, thinking about your uh, emissions from um, those services and, and goods that you procure from your suppliers, and downstream thinking about how we can more effectively uh, measure carbon emissions from uh, the homes that you provide to your customers, residents, and tenants. So a lot of it focus. So that data framework, I think, needs to focus on what you have access to right now, what can be done immediately, and then what needs to be phased into the plan going forward. But what are the ingredients for, uh, for success? 
how can social housing organisations most effectively improve sustainability? I think it all starts out with having a clear target and understanding where you want to go and how you're going to get there. I think that um, in the past we've seen some organisations, not necessarily in the housing sector, but in society at large, uh, throw out a, a target with not necessarily a plan of how to get there. I think we're, we're beyond that stage in, in, this, uh, in this area now, and it's really important to set a meaningful target that you've got a, you've got a solid understanding of how you're going to deliver. So understanding where you are now, what your glide path is, and uh, when you're going to hit the target that you want to achieve, I think is, is really important. It's also worth mentioning that you know, that could be a science-based target linking to um, limiting global warming by, by one and a half degrees. Um, it could be a, an absolute net zero target. And actually, that net zero target can be, can be split out because of the, um, the way social housing organisations are set up. There's, um, there's an argument to say that actually there should be a net zero target for the housing stock and then a net zero target for the corporate operations because the corporate operations of the organisation um, could be decarbonised far quicker than the housing stock, which is a far uh, bigger and more costly process. It's also important to have an action or delivery plan. And I think for this, the, the key thing is sponsorship at a senior level in the organisation and alignment across teams. So this area and this, um, this agenda is going to impact right across the organisation from, you know, from your development, um, part of your organisations through your engineering and estates, parts of your uh, businesses, through to you know, your um, procurement functions. And it's going to require some degree of central coordination and integration into your standard um, formal reporting processes. So it's really important to uh, have alignment behind that delivery plan. And actually, it should all be um, really driven by the data. So it really needs to um, be realistic and, um, and calculated out in terms of what can actually be achieved. So you know, using that data to deliver, um, to make decisions. And actually that, that data can come from, you know, is really important because it, it can be collected from lots of different sources, not necessarily just meet, metering, perhaps from, perhaps from your value chain, perhaps from other, other areas. But effective metering is, is something that's really important in terms of uh, you know, heat, uh, fleet, and uh, utilities. And that can then drive insightful reporting that can help, under, help you understand where you, where you are, understand the base position, provide a, a monitoring strategy to, to continually review that and help identify low, no-cost projects right up to significant capital investment projects, which require you know, solid grounding in, for, the, for the business case. Also then the prioritisation of those business cases and evaluation once they're uh, complete as well. So at, at a high level, what, what does the sector uh, need to improve most? I think we've mentioned really, I think the, the key areas here are decarbonisation of heat, decarbonisation of fleet. And we've seen, we see this now in, in lots of organisations, uh, ESG reports, which are now being developed and also in their annual reporting around things like their carbon emissions. So if there were some key takeaways for uh, social housing organisations trying to improve on sustainability, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd talk about these things. I'd talk about planning now for the future, understand your day one position, set a baseline against your, your key metrics, your, your key impacts once you understand what they are. Uh, understand the, the cost of inaction. What happens if you if you don't do anything now? Does that put you at a competitive disadvantage? Does that make other organisations more attractive to investors? What does that do to your competitive position? And use that data to drive realistic targets. So not just setting setting um, a sort of one-off uh, greenwash white elephant type projects, which might be 
sort of a, a solar or a small scale um, low carbon development. Actually, this is about decarbonisation at a complete organisational level. So really understanding the impact, setting the right target, understanding the glide path for how you're going to get there, the business case to get there, and the, uh, the amount of uh, funding that you might need to get there is, is really important. Having a structured process. So um, typically in, uh, in ISAs, we talk about a process to, to plan something, to do something, to, to check it, to evaluate it, and then to return back through the cyclical process. And, and that uh, process flow is something that I think is really going to be important here, uh, because ultimately all of these projects have to be reviewed and you know, will be accountable not only to the, the mandated zero carbon um, targets in law, but actually also to, to your customers, tenements, tenants and residents as well. So it's really important to, to be able to review those. Also, don't be afraid to, to ask the experts. So you know, there's, a, there's lots of expertise out there in the sector. I think as a, as a sector, the, the housing uh, sector is, is brilliant at sharing resource and sharing, sharing knowledge. There's lots of expertise out there. And don't be afraid to, uh, to ask for it. Uh, looking forward to taking some uh, some questions once we uh, get through the final presentation. I've seen some uh, some really interesting points come up, so hopefully that was useful as a uh, as a sort of starter to think about the key areas that you could um, integrate into your plan. Fabulous! Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Yeah, lots lots of uh, food for thought there, and I'm going to move swiftly on just so we do have um, time for for questions at the end. Um, uh, yeah, th thanks, Dan. And Will, uh, the floor is yours. It's over to you. Hi, thanks very much. Um, right. Uh, I thought I'd start with no slides today, give you a bit of uh, an eye rest. You can just listen to my mellifluous Aussie accent, um, mainly because you're getting some preview of some changes that we're making uh, today. We are in the midst of refreshing our sustainability strategy. I guess what we've recognised is that environmental sustainability sits as part of a broader approach to sustainability in Clarion. Uh, the idea being that we focus on creating a healthy environment, resilient society and good governance together uh, as, a, as a whole, alongside I guess, in conjunction with our mission to provide good quality, affordable homes and neighbourhoods to people failed by the market. So that's really important to to pull that all together. But focusing in on on uh, environmental sustainability, like the other aspects of sustainability, it's got to flow across the three main pillars of our business. That's the homes that we own, the assets, the developments that we we build, which are becoming an increasingly large amount, a part of uh, of, of of what we do, and um, our operations or how we do business. And that includes the support of our charitable foundation too. Uh, I'm not going to talk about homes or development directly today, but it is important to realise that these really are the big hitters in terms of, of impact if you look at things in the round. That said, particularly for larger organisations like Clarion, uh, the operations or the way that we do business is a really a key business, a key, a key pillar, not least because it covers a substantial supply chain. Uh, in our case, that's hundreds of millions of procurement per year. It covers uh, 4,000 employees and dozens of offices across the country, let alone other uh, supporting functions. And as we seek uh, labelling and, uh, uh, I guess, recognition of our approach to sustainability through uh, seeking labels like the Certified Sustainable Housing Label, which we've uh, been lucky enough to to, to receive and be reapproved of uh, uh, recently, um, and the sustainability bond financing uh, that we have been targeting, you know, in order to build new, more new, affordable, and energy efficient homes, uh, we, we can't leave our operational impacts to the side. Uh, those stakeholders, you know, stakeholders want to know that we are doing business in the right way. You know, that that 
we are managing our, our risks and we are setting our pathway, if you like, or finding our way on that pathway to, to zero carbon. So, yeah, as I mentioned, the impetus for change has, has, has been broad. That's really come from across all our stakeholders, uh, employees, a government, both local and, and, and national, uh, the residents and communities themselves. Uh, and I guess our, our board and senior management have recognised this um, universe, I guess almost universal uh, pressure coming alongside a shifting regulatory environment which we're, we're working in. And, uh, you know, that has led them to, to, to look to sustainability as, and the need to align that with our core social purpose and our responsibility to provide and demonstrate value for money as a, as a housing provider, affordable housing provider. The newest drive um, is coming from financial institutions and investors. That's been a fairly rapid shift over the past, well, probably th 36 months really or less. Uh, and it's really seen a rapid acceleration in terms of the demands as we access the capital markets, the, the, the requests that we've had for information and the, the due diligence that they're doing, even just standard investment, not to mention people who are looking for impact investment as we as we push ourselves out there. Um, but alongside that, for a long time, we've been focused on practical actions that address the needs of environmental sustainability. Uh, and you know, some of the changes that have been discussed have already been mentioned. Collecting, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick out a few things, and they've already been mentioned. Collecting and improving our data has been key, and this is an ongoing task um, across all our impact areas, whether it be energy consumption and carbon, um, waste, biodiversity. Uh, we have seen a need to really up our game on, on data collection. And as a sector, I think we've been probably slightly behind corporates on this, but we're, we're working quite rapidly on that now. Uh, another change that, that, that we've made that I think is, is worth picking up on is the procurement of zero carbon electricity um, and certificated electricity. That's, that's been a, our ability to, to procure that at low or no cost addition has been a, a really big change uh, and has a substantial impact on our, our bottom line carbon footprint, particularly as it covers all our landlord supplies. The other part of that I think that I pick out is probably the modernisation and rationalisation of office space. And this is something that I guess we started pre-COVID, but I, I think that, that, that um, the last 12 months have demonstrated our ability to change the way that we uh, work within our office space, both owned and leased. And that, you know, in uh, in uh, you know, uh, Luba's presentation about the the reduce, actually reducing the amount of space you have is a really good way of reducing your your impacts. Uh, full stop. Alongside that, van fleet transformation, which Dan mentioned, um, through reduced demand, i.e., just uh, you know re reducing the amount of visits that we have to do. Uh, reduce, optimizing our logistics, providing I think alternative mobility solutions, including electric vehicles, are, are key as well. Um, and, and alongside that, I'd actually pick out the social side and realising, you know, social value in our contracts. It's not environmental sustainability related, but I think it's important to pick up. What's planned in the future for us? Well, we're going to, I think, really start to move away from a sustainability function doing everything green to a, an ownership model that embeds within the organisations. Many decisions that are made on a daily basis at a managerial level and an employee level are sustainability decisions and providing more training and developing tools for different functions that, that enable and empower stuff is, is, is really critical. Uh, and so we're focusing on that. I think also introducing, introducing a stronger procurement strategies and policies for supply chain partners, recognising that um, our supply chain and the transfer of obligations to them and the management of that supply chain is a big driver for uh, improvement and, and our scope three emissions, in particular in terms of carbon, are um, a, a big uh, issue that we need to tackle, something that we haven't been measuring up until, up until now. And starting with an environmentally extended input-output analysis, i.e. looking at where we spend our money and what carbon implications that has, I think is, is really critical to that. 
Uh, finally, I think uh, I'll, uh, we're going to look at a rating of office buildings uh, using, particularly using neighbours uh, as an operational performance metric for the offices that we do retain. Um, I'm not going to mention communal heating systems, although they are a big part of scope one and two emissions. That's probably a discussion for another day. Um, I'm conscious that I'm sort of running towards the end of time, so I'll skip. I'll skip to some some advice, really. Uh, and I think there's probably five things that 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 I'd pick up on. First of all, the need to start with the end goals in mind. Um, I guess we need to recognise that the era of incremental improvement in environmental performance is really over and we need to be clear about the, the full scale of the challenges for us ahead, particularly on the carbon front, net zero, and get the whole organisation to realise that, whether it's IT or offices or stationery or HR, it can't be the responsibility of just a single sustainability manager or a sustainability function. You've got to embed that within the business. As such, the second piece of advice is don't underestimate to make the change exercise that's required and the need to bring your whole organisation, the people with you, top to bottom. Um, this sector has undergone lots of change in lots of different areas, but what we've learned, I hope, is that there's a need to empower staff um, to own these challenges and to remove the, the, the idea that sustainability is somebody else's job. Uh, alongside this, I think working with our supply chain partners, which I've already mentioned, um, the rules that we, we set purchases are critical. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and and the last one that I probably mentioned alongside the staff is the idea to, to align your incentives. I guess realizing that the role, the role of staff welfare and the way we um, we, we uh, deal with employees and the way they are rewarded is critical to to their buy-in. Uh, but finally, I'd say, look, with crisis comes opportunity. Uh, and if the last year has taught us anything, it is the ability we have to radically transform our organisations quite quite rapidly and our ways of working. So, you know, be bold. And that's where I'll end it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, absolutely. A, a great challenge uh, to everybody tuning in there. Um, we are, um, uh, thank you all for some, some absolutely fantastic presentations. I'm going to move straight into questions from the audience because we are, we are running a little short on time. Um, so uh, I think it'd be relatively concise answers if possible, and we'll try and get through as many as, as we can. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, some specific questions. Um, for Lubo, there was a couple for you. Um, uh, that's uh, sort of a very interesting presentation. Could you please expand on the cost assumptions in your presentation? That's from Jim Dyer. And then a, a quite a specific one from Philip Collins, which kind of is along similar lines. What is the cost of hemp line construction um, per metre squared compared to traditional construction for a standard Two bedroom house. So, so some of the cost assumptions, uh, Lubo, I'll, I'll, I'll hurl with that, those two at you. Okay. Well, cost assumptions were based on on base uh, document uh, that uh, is uh, is publicly available, uh, but then in that mix uh, were uh, costs of renewables, costs of uh, additional insulation, uh, costs of uh, hemp lime, and so on. So, um, bits and pieces of costs were collected from various sources, but. Uh, mainly based on various costs. Uh, and uh, I have, I think, somewhere linked to that document that I'm happy to share. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So, uh, OK, that, that, that will be great. So we can get in touch with uh, um, the links to the documents. Thank you, uh, Levo, very much. Um, I'm going to move to I mean, a kind of, kind of question. I mean, Will, you, uh, sorry, Dan, you were talking about the data um, and, and how that drives decision making. How, how does that kind of feed into what you need within your organisations as well? So you, you, you can click the but, but there's a couple of questions around. I mean, there's one from um, Mary who is talking about supported housing and independent living facilities. How can we get um, uh, residents, older people involved and excited about environmental sustainability? And quite a question, which is, links, but I'll, I'll, I'll cheaply kind of um, link them a little bit, um, which is about uh, from Jill uh, Brown. Do you think housing association should have a board director, zero carbon champion? So how do you get kind of people you, talking about the data? But how do you get people kind of excited about it? Cause, uh, you know, buying in, in in a kind of wide way to to, to what organisations should be doing in the first place to kind of get to that point. So uh, yeah, Dan, over to you. Uh, I, I think it's a couple of really interesting interesting points there. So um, the point about supported housing and independent living. Uh, and, and engagement there is is 
is, is great. I think generally, as, as we've said in the presentations, that there is a, a groundswell of public interest in this area. So uh, many housing associations will get more and more questions about actually what they're doing, what they're, what is being done in their particular areas, what is the carbon footprint of, of you know, the shared spaces that I pay for through my service charge or in you know, the, the, the unit that I, that I live in. So that data actually gives all the answers. To, to those questions. What, what has been done, we've reduced from X to Y uh, through completing this initiative. And actually providing the data does provide then a, a level of engagement because they're being um, residents, tenants, uh, and so on, are able to see uh, their current position and able to, to do something about it. I think the question around um, zero carbon champions, are, I think, uh, to Will's point earlier, actually, uh, uh, there is something to be said for, for having uh, a central function to, to pull all this together, but actually the ownership for the, um, for the respective um, constituent parts might sit more neatly with um, all of those professionals who sit in each of those individual areas, so things like procurement, things like estates, things like development teams. But bringing your sponsorship and, and some... Um, some ownership of that information so that it's able to be dispersed to, to customers and into the public domain is, is really important, yes. Thanks very much, Dan. Much appreciated. I'm going to move on to another couple of questions uh, now, and, and Hannah, I'll bring you, you into the conversation, if that's okay. And this, this is about the... Uh, I mean, we talked about office footprints earlier um, in my introduction, you know, um, this kind of shift following the pandemic, um, uh, I guess, how, how significant a moment do you think it is? And the, the, the specific questions that have come in, Jessica Marshall, um, what do you suggest as we move back to offices, but in a, a reduced capacity, which could actually um, decrease uh, um, energy efficiency of office buildings, especially those leased where control is less? Um, and uh, I, I mean, a, a kind of future movement from uh, Robin here as well, more of a statement, going to be an awful lot of commercial property being dumped onto the marketplace at broadly the same time. So I guess that, that kind of future direction in, in, in terms of um, just that, that office environment. So Hannah, I'll bring you back in if that's okay. Yeah, thanks. I think I think to pick up as well on what Dan said, um, this is a massive opportunity for change and it's a moment to bring people along with you. Um, we know that people are concerned. We know there's been a big shift in, you know, working from home previously being seen as something that you do that around to now being something that people can be trusted to do. So I think bringing people in on the journey, giving people the option to decide where they want to work from if you can make that work. Um, but also just to, to pick up on, on how we do that, this, this comment about transparency and data gathering, um, I think that's really key is, is – being open about the impact that you're having and how you're looking to improve it. And we shouldn't be scared of not being able to tell a perfect story. I think that often holds people back from talking about this because you say, we don't have all our data in place yet and we, we know we're not ready to, to show how well we've done. I think you earn a lot more trust, both from the people working for you and the people who you work for, um, through saying, this is where we're at and this is where we're headed and this is how we're going to do it and showing people how they can help you along the way. Great answer. Thanks very much. And I'm going to move to Will next with the kind of similar question about that, yeah, this, this kind of opportunity. And is there a danger that it could turn to a, a massive opportunity as well? I mean, there's this moment in time where everybody's reorganising and is, is that kind of at the front of people's minds? Um, and there is a, a specific question for you, Will, as well, um, which is from Richard Knight, how are you able to obtain zero carbon electricity at low or no cost increase? So, um, yeah, a couple, couple for you, Will. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Exactly that. It is a it is a potential opportunity. It could, it could be a potential opportunity missed um, if you don't deal with this in the right way. And that really is about recognising who are the people in the organisations that are in charge of making the changes, in charge of making the decisions related to these changes, and empowering them with the tools uh, and the knowledge to 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 lead them towards you know more sustainable choices. And recognizing that you know a, a change from home working, a change from office working to home working, 
you know, means there's still going to be an impact in terms of heating and cooling and lighting and everything like that. You know, perhaps that should become part of our staff welfare packages now or, or benefits. Um, you know, there are lots of opportunities here, but I think it's about framing this in the right way. So that's an HR decision. It's got nothing to do necessarily with facilities. But you know, you can see how the need to kind of spread this out within the organisation is crucial. And, you know, I'm just one person. I've got a couple of people to help me, but... but um, you know, I, I really need everybody to understand and, and, and buy in. And I think there was that specific question. Sorry, did you pick up on that? Um, the uh, the zero carbon electricity question. Oh, yeah, the zero carbon electricity. Um, we I couldn't tell you the exact number in terms of cost impact. Um, it's very, very small, and it was certainly didn't make our procurement um, colleagues or our service charge colleagues uncomfortable, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> get, get, get here. Right, we, we've got a, few, a couple of minutes, which I'm, I'm just going to bounce through. Um, uh, uh, Lubo, I might bring you back in. There's a question from Claire Marie. Um, how far will, uh, will the Park L and Park F building regulation uplifts take us on this journey? Um, I think referring to your, your presentation. And, uh, and I might then um, uh, bring people back in uh, just uh, about... There's a question from Jill, which says, uh, Jill Brown... Um, it would be helpful if individuals had three simple and concise principles that we could follow as we live in our homes to reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, I guess for the office space as well, um, along the lines of hand space face used use during the pandemic. Um, so it's about that kind of starting point as well. Is, is there a kind of uh, mantra uh, people should be following? So Lubo, over to you. Yes. Okay. So um, uh, Bartel will make a lot of difference. Uh, what's happening at the moment is that uh, uh, developers always try to uh, uh, do um, a kind of uh, to do developments to a common denominator which is partel uh, and uh, uh, doing more uh, over and above partel uh, will cost more money and therefore it won't be profitable as much as uh, uh, if they do for partel so if uh, if the bar is raised higher then everybody will be on the same level playing field uh, sorry to use that phrase. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, I think there will be improvement in building performance, in, in uh, uh, getting uh, the opportunity to get to net zero. Thank, thanks very much, Nemo. And, and I will um, throw, Hannah, Hannah uh, I'll, I'll throw that, that, that um, attempt to define a, a hand space, a, a mantra uh, for, for individuals and organisations to follow. So is, is there anything that you... It, you can throw out there. Um, so that's probably a horrible question to, to her at you, but um, I, I no, it's always... fine. Just as a comms person, I want to say something really good. Um, no, I would just say em embrace flexibility um, and flexibility in the way that you heat your homes. And even though the price signal isn't there at the moment, uh, trust that investment now will have long term benefits, not just in terms of comfort and volume of energy usage, but in terms of cost too. Um, in, you know, investments in low carbon now will be beneficial now will be even more beneficial in the future and we just need to trust that at this point great answer thank, thank you very much hannah and i'm gonna uh, uh will i might throw one more question at you i think we're just about out of time um uh, uh from daniel most of us face the potential additional costs in the billions over and above our standard investment profiles do we envisage that funding availability will be revised to meet this? So where, where's the funding going to um, come into play here? And if you've got an answer as well, um, it would be it would be great to hear that. <laughs> uh, Mantra-wise, maybe something like uh, measure, think, act, and share. So me measure what you measure what you what your performance is like. Dan said, think about the environmental sustainability aspects and what you can do. Act on it. Uh, you know, create the action plan, and then tell everyone. Share share what your experience, as 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 Hannah suggests. Um, I think on, on the specific question of investment um, and the need for you know there is definitely a need for shared ownership around the the investment required. You know we are as an organize as organize social housing organisations potentially shouldering a lot of the burden um, for for z uh, zero carbon that potentially then cascades down into an impacts on our ability to build affordable homes 
or to provide um, you know, homes for those in the you know, at the poorer end of the spectrum. So really there is a question about who should be shouldering the burden. Certainly BASE has indicated that um, there is going to be significantly more money available for this um, you know, in, the, in the housing side and you know, certainly on the communal heating side as well. And I think also on the energy efficiency, business energy efficiency side, that, that's something that there are, there are still plenty of gaps and bits that we need to address, like vehicle fleet transformation potentially and electric vehicle charging points. But you know, everything's heading in the right direction and we as a sector just have to make sure our message is, is heard at the, at the policymaker, with the policymakers. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, and that feels like a, an appropriately upbeat um, uh, moment to end on. So thank you all very much. Um, thanks to Hannah, Lubo, Dan and Will uh, for some great insights and some great presentations uh, and, and for answering uh, a decent uh, cross-section of your uh, questions as well. Thank you all for tuning in. I uh, very much appreciate it. Um, thanks to Anenco uh, for the sponsorship of making uh, today possible. Um, and, yeah, all, all that remains for me to say is Thank you very much for, for, for joining today and hopefully see you all again soon. Thank you all very much. Um, Mr. Chair, can I can I ask uh, before we go? Uh, yes, I, th I think so. I think we're still we're still live, Lubo. So yeah, yeah, go go for right. it. Yes. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, uh, there's um, a few unanswered questions that were kind of uh, directed at me, and I was wondering whether you could perhaps share these questions and and uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, give me an opportunity to reply offline in some way. I'm not sure how, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I think it... we can, we can um, yeah, sh sh share some of that. And I know you've been answering some of those questions as far as I can see um, individually yeah. as well. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we can share share some of those questions, certainly, and um, and, and, and flag them. So, yeah, th thanks very much. And, um, yeah, apologies if you didn't get your question addressed today. Um, we, we, we got through a, a decent number of them, but but but, but not quite everybody. Um, uh, but it goes to show that how... Uh, and it's it's pleasing to see so many people um, uh, caring about this and, and, and actually uh, with, with lots of questions that they want answered. So, um, yeah, we, we can pick up on some of those afterwards. And, um, yeah, th th thanks again to the audience for for being so enthusiastic and sending so many questions in. Um, very much appreciated. Um, right, I will um, bring things to a, a, a close on, at that point. And, um, yeah, that, thank you all um, very much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you.